Spencer, good morning to you. Good morning, Rob. So the question I have for you guys is, have you figured out the whole Myrtle Beach thing yet? You guys know where to go to eat, where the best places are at night after the ball games are over, where the action is? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, the last night was our first late night, obviously, because the game went, one of the games went until 9 o'clock. Mm-hmm. But yeah, right down the road from where we're staying, there's a pretty nice, you know, water and whole place. You know, we had some, we had some good food last night. Uh, but it was a good day of baseball yesterday, and uh, it's going to be another great day today. Yeah, uh, and, and by the way, I want to uh, thank you, by the way, for calling in here. We had our our nine o'clock guests. Some calendar confusion on my part. They're actually on tomorrow, so we had an open segment here. So I sent a text out to uh, Spencer and the guys to see if they could call in and give us a little update on what's happening at uh, Myrtle Beach. So if you could recap the tournament down there so far to this point, four of our six Berkeley and Jefferson County baseball teams are down there, correct? Yes, so it's Martinsburg, Hedgesville, Jefferson, and Washington. And uh, we'll start kind of in time order yesterday. Uh, Hedgesville got things started yesterday against a team out of North Carolina, Concord Academy. They were able to take a 12-4 victory, and uh, Braylon Connor, the shortstop, went four for four. He had an RBI. He also had, and uh, Brett Pedersen, the uh, catcher, hit a home run. He went one for two, one for three with two RBIs. Jackson Ruiz got the win on the mound. Six strikeouts for them. They got a 12-4 victory to start things off. And then Jefferson also had the 12:30 slot as well. They took on McClancy, a team out of New York. They won three to one, and a special three to one victory for them uh, because that was head coach John Lowry Sr.'s 1400th career victory overall. Um, what a great, what a great number there! And obviously, to kind of better enjoy it at the beach, the team definitely probably did something yesterday to celebrate Coach Lowry. That's pretty cool. He establishes new records every year that he coaches because of his tenure as the only baseball coach in the history of Jefferson High School. And picking up 1,400 wins is an insane number. Have you gotten a chance to talk with him yet about that, Spencer? We will. We have not. We're going to get a chance to talk to him tomorrow about it. We'll have their game tomorrow uh, against uh, another North Carolina team, High Point Christian. That's a 12:30 first pitch tomorrow. Uh, we'll be able to talk to him then and uh, probably have – you know, three, four, five-minute conversation as part of the pregame interview. Spencer, do you know of anyone throughout the nation that uh, that's close to Coach Lauer, 1,400 wins? I personally do not. I know that uh, when I was reading up on when Coach Lowry got into that latest Hall of Fame, there was another high school coach that uh, put kind of put up some similar numbers, not too sure how close they were. Uh, off the top of my head, but uh, you know, it's it's definitely hard to even get close to that. We're talking with our color analyst and Berkeley Post 14 Hornets manager Trip Tobin. He said, if if you do that, you have to win like 30 games a year for like. He was trying to do the math in his head, and I'm like, that's just something that's unheard of, especially now. I don't feel like your coach. I don't feel like if you start coaching now, you're going to coach for the next 60, 70 years. <laughs> if you think about that, if you, if, you won, if you won 25 games a year as a baseball coach and you coached 40 years, that's 1,000. He's 400 wins beyond that. Exactly. How many years has he been coaching? Since the school started, since Jefferson High School was a, base, was a high school. And what, what was that, 72, 73? Was that the I believe, first year? and then before that, I believe he was at Charlestown High School, if I mm-hmm. remember correctly from what I've read. I think you're right on that. So about 50 years, 50 years plus. Yeah, That's yeah. a pretty amazing accomplishment. Yeah. Who, who looks good down there right now, Spencer? Uh, well, definitely I'd like to, I, you know, last, last night we had a pretty classic game. It kind of reminded us of last night, or excuse me, last year, when uh, Washington took on Waccamaw. They went to extra innings last year. They went to extra innings last night. Uh, uh, Colin Reed, who is right now, is just a designated hitter. He usually pitches and uh, plays the field, but he's got an injury right now that's limiting him to just designated hitting. He went four for five last night, three RBIs. Uh, He had a double, um, and he had a stolen base as well, and he looks really good. Their pitcher looks pretty good coming in, Brandon Dunbar. 
He went five and a third innings last night. He gave up six runs, but only three were earned. Uh, they got the ten to seven win over one of the hosts, Wagamaw. Uh, you know, I think that's kind of besides Hedgesville, twelve runs, the ten runs there is the second biggest offensive outburst uh, from an EPAC team down here. And uh, you know, looking at uh, can't not mention Martinsburg. Unfortunately, they fell yesterday. In their game against Archbishop Malloy out in New York, but it was a pretty good game going for Braden Oviedo on the mound. He ended up going six innings, or excuse me, five innings. In the fifth inning, gave up three runs, uh, but before that, he had tallied seven strikeouts and scattered around four hits. So, so he was bringing it for a while. Braden Oviedo looked great. Yeah. Hey, uh, what's your schedule today? Set up the entire broadcast day. Okay, so our day today. We're getting ready here probably in the next 45 minutes to head up northwest, I guess you'd say. Uh, we're going to go past west of Conway to Anor High School. Where we'll be broadcasting Hedgesville's game against, ironically, a West Virginia team in Princeton. That's set for 1230. Uh, then Martinsburg takes on Georgetown, one of the host schools. That's a 730 first pitch. And then... Uh, There'll be two other games today. As at 5:30, Jefferson takes on Waccamaw, and Washington will take on McClancy. That's at 12:30. So we'll do the Hedgesville Princeton game, the Martinsburg Georgetown game, uh, but that's two that we'll have for you today. And then tomorrow we'll have three games. Does it depend on who wins or whatever? Or are those already set? So the net, today and tomorrow are set. It'll decide Friday, tomorrow. And Tomorrow's games will decide how they kind of seed Friday. They have kind of like a bracket of teams in each each area, and then whoever they'll kind of play each other. Usually, you don't see a matchup again, but uh, that could potentially happen. But we're tracking some weather here for Friday that could push things to Saturday. Saturday. Are you getting a bat? Is it like one of those all-day rainout kind of washout things, or what? That's what we're looking at so far, but you never know, Rob. It's the beach. Things could change left and right. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. You're in those southern climates. All right, you make it to Fuddruckers yet? Unfortunately, we have not made it to Fuddruckers. That that could be this afternoon's lunch. I am I am bent on getting you guys to Fuddruckers down there. <laughs> You really are. Yes, yesterday <laughs> when I gave you a call. Hey, I, I heard uh, the uh, the Martinsburg game was played in an hour and a half yesterday. Yeah, it was. Braden Oviedo on the mound for Martinsburg was rolling. I said he had seven strikeouts. Things were going. Martinsburg got out to a one nothing lead on a Carson Buber RBI single in the top of the first inning. And then, you know, it was just – it was kind of like there was a pitch clock. Like, I don't know what it was, but the game started 13 minutes later than the scheduled time, and it got done. So it started at 3.13 and got done by 5.47 p.m. I, I, you know, you've been busy. You've been busy calling games, you know, at the high school level. But I don't know how many major league games you've had a chance to watch since they put the pitch clock in the twenty second pitch clock. But I got to tell you, I'm loving this thing. I mean, th these yeah, games I mean, are lasting two fifteen. Yeah, I've not got a chance to watch a ton of games, but I have seen a game. It seems to be going a lot faster. Or listening, like Colin and I were listening a couple of weeks back, and it just we were gone for an hour and a half, and all of a sudden they were in the ninth inning. Yeah. It's great. The pace of the game has completely changed. It looks like the game look, used to look in the 70s and, and probably for, for uh, you know, 50 years before that. Uh, there's no wasting time anymore. It's, you know, get the ball, yeah. get your sign, and throw it. it. We talk about the pitchers. Yeah. Also, the batters, they can only call one timeout yeah. or one pause during their, um, uh, while they're up the plate. And you can only throw it to, the, to first base twice. That's right. If you throw it a third time, you better pick them mm -hmm. off or else. And, uh, you know, they're enforcing everything. They're, they're, there's not arguments on the field over it. They all had to get used to it in spring training, and they're, they're rolling. I always, I always thought, you know, if you can call a play in football and you can get 11 people organized in 25 seconds, why does it take a minute to throw a pitch in baseball? Yeah. Exactly. Right? Yeah. 20 seconds. Get yeah. the ball, throw it. You, you mentioned yeah, a couple – back... Go ahead, Spencer. Going Sorry. back to uh... – Going back to what uh, that Martinsburg game, it just seemed like every time somebody got up there, they got in the box, and they were first pitch swinging. Yeah. I mean, there's 10 total hits in the game that had four runs, and I think, what, three of them happened in the first inning for Martinsburg of their four hits? They only 
scattered one eight the rest of the way. Do they make a a point because this is a tournament and there's a schedule and locations you got to get to and get teams on and off the field? Do they make a point to move these games along quickly? I think that kind of thing is like like yesterday was we we're uh, broadcasting next to the Martinsburg dugout and you could hear Coach Byler kind of say, "Come on, guys, no no uh, messing around, just get in the box and go." Like. Mm-hmm. I think that that they know that uh, you know it's a long tournament. They don't want teams waiting forever to play games because they've probably been on the other end of that. Oh. Yeah, watching the Oriole game last night, one of the uh, uh, the first basemen got nine RBIs during the game. Nine, nine RBIs. Yeah, he had a, I'm pretty sure he had a grand slam. He did. He hit a grand. Wow. He had a grand slam, uh, uh, but he had uh, I think five runs batted in before that. So he. What a night he had. That's a month. That's a month. That's a month. Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, Spencer, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, have a good time down there and stay safe. Go to Fuddruckers. Thank you. We'll check in tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> See you later. Uh, Spencer, please, sports director here at Talk uh, Radio WRNR and TV 10. We're down there with our TV cameras, and uh, you can catch all the action from the games that we're covering while four of our six local teams are in uh, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, their annual trip for the baseball tournaments down there. A great location for that, too. Back to uh, Chief George Swartwood from the last segment, Bill. I asked uh, him, how, you know, about the why now is the time to retire? And you've gone through this yourself about when it's time to retire. I have. My wife has. We know in our generation know a lot of people. For some reason, it just feels right. And uh, you, you ask yourself the question going up to it, well, I know the time, and uh, but then it just everything comes together and you say, it, it just feels right. So I can, I can identify what he's saying right now. Do you, did you deny it for a little while? Or did you put it off like a year or two? Or I, is it, it's now, it's now, it's now. I'm not sure I denied it. I was, uh, I was questioning, and, uh, and there was always, it was feeling a little bit more comfortable, but there's also a reason you did not want to retire. And then at certain points, I'm not sure it's any one thing or just kind of a transitional uh, uh, series of transitional uh, events. You just say, well, I'm it's ready to go. I'm ready to look for something new to do. I've had a great career. I've enjoyed it com- tremendously. But there's always something on the other side of the mountain that I'm ready to, uh, to look at and explore. As, and it's, it's proven that way. Mm-hmm. Well, if you wouldn't have retired, you wouldn't be able to do this. Oh, and that's right. <laughs> and I had this in mind, Rob. Oh, this, well, was, this was an aspirational <laughs> goal of mine for years. Very, very <laughs> lucrative right. careers as a coach. <laughs> exactly right. And the way that I pronounce or murder the English language, I'm surprised you put up with it. <laughs> it's just it's aggravated assault. I wouldn't go as far as to call it to call it murder. Uh, uh, a murder. But, but but still, in the career that you had, I mean, you were on a boat. How many how many months out of a year would you be on a on a ship? Well, uh, when you're assigned a ship, you're not assigned to the ship the whole time. Mm -hmm. Uh, You have shore assignments. In my case, I was in a research lab for a while. Uh, Then I was uh, in ship management for a while. And then I was uh, uh, upper upper management for the organization for a while. But when I'm assigned to a ship, we'd be at sea for probably uh, seven to eight months at a time. Not continually, but you would be uh, you'd be in port three or four days, and then you go back to sea. But if you're in port, you're not in port anywhere near home. No, 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 you're not in, in not anywhere near home. Exactly right. Right. Yeah. So, obviously, that's a long time to be yeah on, on the ocean. But do you miss the ocean? You you spent uh, much of your life dedicated to it. I enjoyed the I enjoy the ocean. I enjoy ships. Uh, ships were. A small community, each ship had its own personality. You laugh about it and say, well, when the captain changes, the ship's personality is going to change. That's not right. There are some very happy ships. There are some ships that are a, a very directed, very focused in what they do. And the uh, the folks that man the ship, uh, uh, the, the sailors, the, uh, uh, the merchant marine, whoever manages the ship, tends to pick up the philosophy of the ship fairly quickly. Yes, I'm, I miss very very much the camaraderie, the community aspect of a ship. Uh, it's uh, and there's nothing more enjoyable than seeing the sun come up over the horizon uh, on a tranquil sea. Uh, there's something nothing much more uh, uh, disturbing 
than seeing where you cannot see the horizon because the mountainous seas and you've experienced all of them you've experienced some uh, the the calm of the sea and the the uh, the energy of the sea and so yeah i i miss it all i'm i miss the places you can go uh there's not many opportunities to get to antarctica now you can with all these commercial ships going <laughs> uh but the set the where i went to antarctica there's no commercial ships so you have a chance to get to places that you're not normally be able to visit it, there's a lot there's a dynamic there's sure. many 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 elements of going to sea that i really enjoyed and i miss and that's why you bought a place on the river. Yeah, that's why I bought a place. Got to be, by, gotta be <laughs> by the water. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, in talking with uh, Chief Swarf, what he mentioned that his health is fine. Yeah. He's, he's got his health. This is the time to step aside. And when you listen to the news, watch the news, and each day there's a new shooting, it seems. And uh, each day there seems to be a police officer whose uh, life in danger. Uh, perhaps paying the ultimate price. And if you're in that line of duty, and, and George didn't allude to this at all. Well, we did talk about it off air. Uh, during the interview. Yeah, yeah. Um, but as you hear that in the news every day, I have to wonder, at some point along the way, does that all get to the point where you're thinking, i got to get out of this before it's my day? Or does your spouse think that? Your spouse probably thinks that every day. I have many neighbors who are, in some form or fashion, a police officer at various levels, agencies, and uh, states uh, in my neighborhood, including my next-door neighbor. And the, the, the pressure on their spouses when something happens, it's one of those deals where it's in the back of your head with that phone call, right? Sort of... Like if you have a relative that's in an active duty zone, you know, there's that dreaded phone call. And I always think about what kind of stress that plays in making a decision ultimately when it's time to leave or retire. Yeah, and also, Rob, you realize you do not have total control. You don't. Uh, you can train as much as you as you possibly can. You can make all preparations. But in the case of the school shootings, that is – one, it's going to be very sudden. Going to you have very little warning about it, and there's nothing that you if, once it starts happening, you just you can react. That's all you can do is react uh, to a much lesser degree. And I'm not about to try to compare this to the stress that the our police force has. Mm -hmm. But I saw the same thing on the ships. And as I was getting closer and closer to retirement, I realized I had avoided several bullets. And there were numerous instances that disaster could have happened except for this last minute skill of the of the captain or the or the ship uh we could have put uh, could have put ships on uh high and dry in antarctica uh we could have had a uh, there's numerous cases of coming into port we were fortunate that nobody was hurt going to sea is a dangerous uh it's a dangerous environment if you're not careful but as i said i'm not trying to compare it all mm -hmm. to anything the police do but in in the case of the police, uh, I'm sure it enters every policeman's mind that we were able to avoid the proverbial bullet or the incident yesterday. Am I going to be so lucky today? And it has to, it has to gnaw at you. Uh, and I said we have conscientious chiefs we have con conscientious uh policemen uh and uh, they train hard they train well but there's a limit of how much they can do so yeah. much is that you, the unknown that you have no control over uh i'm i'm not and we did talk about this off air uh, uh the chief did not say that was his reason uh he did say he like everybody else every other human thinks about it of of the possibility it could happen Sure. How could you not? Yeah. Right. Especially when it's in the news so much. Yeah, it is. Yes, yes. And it becomes more frequent. And uh, uh, there's this phenomena of copycat. Uh, and I think we're seeing a lot of that. Uh, the frightening thing of the copycat is it just encourages more and more and more people. Uh, I don't think we're going to see a uh, demise of it. I think we're going to see it more frequent. Uh, you and I have talked about this many times off air. Uh, what can we do about it? 
right now nobody has come up with a good solution uh, there are certain things you can do for precaution you can harden the schools uh, you can have a, a police uh, 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 police in the hallways uh, and certainly we should protect the schools, but we have the synagogues, we have the churches, we have the post offices. Uh, we have, we're so vulnerable in today's society uh, that someone with ill intent can take advantage. And I think all of it is someone's getting the notoriety. Uh, the one in the post office in Louisville, the guy screamed it, was screaming live screaming. He wanted the publicity. He knew he was going to die. That was going to be happy. He, his goal at that time was to have live screaming to show the world what he was doing. And that, to me, that is a frightening trend that we're seeing today. And I don't know how you learn what the factors are yeah. that motivate a person to want to go down that way and i'm not sure there is a convenient category of factors uh as humans we have we all react to things in different ways we act to different things in different ways uh they uh i hear the argument it's a mental health problem uh it may be a mental health problem but we do not have the capability in our country today to address all the all the possible mental health issues that would drive someone in this direction there's so, not enough money in the world to study all that's that. exactly right there's not enough money uh and then there's not enough money in the world to uh to uh, uh to harden all the facilities uh i'm as you know i'm not a bit big advocate of uh, uh of, of having a guns in these places because i think that there's there's risk there you've you've made a very convincing argument uh that what other recourse we have uh i don't know the answer to that uh, i i'm i'm uncomfortable with the fact that everybody carrying a gun but again i don't have a good rebuttal to your argument so i don't know what to do yeah my thought process on that the process on that is there isn't a will right now to do anything about what's going on with the shootings there is no will for that and if and because that will does not exist uh, legislatively, and I don't know what you could do about it legislatively, because that's not there, that means it really comes down to you to defend yourself, which is really what this comes down to right now in terms of what you can do quickly and achievably. And there's not, I don't think there's a whole lot that's going to come out of Washington, D.C. about this yeah. or in state capitals about this. You can, you can ban certain types of guns, but there's 400 million guns in the country. What do you do about all those? You're not going to confiscate those guns. So you, you, can, you can ban a certain type of gun, but you're, they're still guns. Yeah. So that's what, you know. And, and, and you're right. And uh, I, uh, Mike Height uh, just sent uh, a post said, protect yourself. Uh, certain folks are most comfortable in doing that. And that's the argument you're, that you're making. There's a lot of us that are not comfortable in doing that. Uh, so I'm not, again, I come back. I don't know if we... If there is a near-term solution, I there is not. There's not. Uh, there may may or may not be a long-term solution, but we're 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 walking down this path uh, that's becoming much more frequent. I don't. Uh, we've seen a lot more gun uh, uh, shootings this year than we've had in years past. It's not associated with administration. Mm -hmm. It's not associated with any of the government. I think it's this copycat syndrome. If one person gets away with it, they look for. They were looking for notoriety. They're going to do the same thing, and it's hard to predict where they're going to strike next. Yeah, and I think Mike's point is protect yourself, which uh, doesn't stop mass shootings so much as it might stop or mitigate a single mass shooter yeah. right yeah. because there's still yeah. going to be damage exactly done right. yeah. until you can react and, yeah. and hopefully yeah. take down the target uh that you're shooting for yeah. but in the meantime what's at the root of causing all this and and this is really what the issue is why is this a phenomenon in the united states of america it's it happens other places but it yeah. happens with amazing frequency now in this country i think there's two reasons for that one the ready availability of guns Clearly. and uh we we probably uh are 
no other country in the world provides the accessibility of guns like we do in the U.S. And the second thing is, and I'll come back to what I've said a couple so times, the copycat phenomenon. And, uh, and how do you stop this copycat uh, uh, effort?